speaker is Dr. Peter Hainsman. Pete did his PhD at the University of London in the UK, and after that, a postdoc with Beth Chappell at the Paris Institute of Technology in 2013. A variety of organisms, including plants, insects, and Ice Age megafauna. Uh, using those techniques, he He've achieved some remarkable scientific. Uh, uh, he reached some remarkable scientific challenge uh, achievements, such as uh, determine the most precisely constrained timing of the prehistoric of a prehistoric extinction event, which I think is the mammal from Saint Paul Island. Name the first and only genus from ancient DNA data, which I think is Camelops. Resolving the phylogenetic positions of four extinct megafaunal taxa and determined when bison entered North America. More recently, he's been working on the recovery of ancient DNA from sediments to enable community reconstructions through time, which I think is what he's gonna tell us today. So thank you very much for being here, Pete, and the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Darko. Uh, just to correct you there, that genus was Harrington Hippus, the horse. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, really looking forward to it. So uh, basically today I'm gonna talk about environmental paleogenomics, which is kind of this really quite fairly new sub-discipline within ancient DNA. And just uh, give you a couple of case studies about um, kind of like stories that we've learned using this, using sedimentary ancient DNA from lakes. Okay, so just to start off about ancient DNA, what is it? So it's DNA that's basically being broken up. It's being really fragmented, often to less than 100 base pairs, as shown here in this graph. Um, and it's not just fragmented, but it's also the ends that usually have single-stranded overhangs, and those overhangs have damaged bases. And what I mean by damaged bases are that the cytosines have been deaminated into uracils, and those look like thymines. This happens right at the ends of the DNA molecules. So with ancient DNA, when you look at the trans Positions, you can see C to T changes at the five prime end and G to A changes at the three prime end, assuming that you're doing a double stranded library prep. So, uh, what is sedimentary ancient DNA? This is ancient DNA that's recovered from an environmental substrate, so for example, permafrost or lakes, and usually originating from many taxa all mixed together. And environmental paleogenomics is basically the recovery and analysis of genome scale information from sedimentary ancient DNA. So why do we target lakes? Well, the great thing about lakes is that sediment at the lake bottoms is deposited usually nice and steadily through time. And so it provides generally an uninterrupted archive of sediment uh, across temporal boundaries. And this is really useful because it means you can hone in on uh, specific time points within the sediment core and really understand when things were appearing and when things were disappearing. And the great thing about sedimentary ancient DNA is you can get uh, DNA from anything and everything that was preserved that, that was living around the lake, including things that we don't really know much about. Okay, so how do we do this? We start off with our sediment, we extract the DNA, and then there are basically three main techniques that are used to recover uh, sedimentary ancient DNA data. There's metabarcoding PCR, shotgun metagenomics, and targeted enrichment. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm just gonna be talking about shotgun metagenomics, where you take the ancient DNA extract, you add adapters directly, and you sequence the extra, the, uh, the libraries directly. So you get an unbiased view of the taxonomic composition uh, of the sediment. Okay, so on to the case studies. First, I'm gonna talk about our study on when did the last North American mammoths become extinct? So just a bit of background, mammoths uh, during the last ice age, they lived all over Eurasia and especially uh, Northern Europe and uh, Siberia uh, and also parts of North America uh, that weren't glaciated. However, towards the end of the last ice age, their range contracted and they were only found in this area here, which is called Beringia, um, the part of Northeast Siberia, Alaska, and the now inundated Bering Land Bridge. And I know Elisa will introduce this landmass uh, in more detail. So um, 
Basically, mammoths became extinct on the mainlands of Siberia and North America somewhere between around 10 and 12,000 years ago. That's our best estimate. But they survived on islands in the Bering Strait until much, much later. The record is uh, on Wrangel Island off the northeast coast of Siberia. Uh, mammoths survived until around 4,000 years ago. So they survived in isolation for many, many millennia. But, and this, so that's fairly well known, but what's less known is that mammoths also survived on St. Paul Island, which is this tiny little dot just down here until around six and a half thousand years ago. So again, for many millennia after the mainland populations had uh, gone extinct. And St. Paul Island is really, really tiny. Here is the, um, the uh, airstrip, just to give a real sense of scale. And it's amazing that this island actually uh, hosted a mammoth population for several millennia. And this island actually reached its current size several millennia before um, the uh, St. Paul Island mammoths went extinct. So how do we know that they went extinct six and a half thousand years ago? We know that because of radiocarbon dated bones and tusks and teeth that are basically found around this island. But because it's a small island, there aren't really that many remains. And so we haven't got many radiocarbon dates. That means we don't really understand when the St. Paul Island mammoths went extinct. However, we can use sedimentary ancient DNA because mammoths, like all proboscideans, probably had to drink a lot. So they would have been around lakes uh, most of the t a lot of the time. And it just so happens in the center of St. Paul Island, there's a really, really nice lake for this. This lake is called Lake Hill. It's around 200 meters wide, but it's only around two meters deep at the center. Um, but it has 13 meters of sediment at its bottom, spanning around 18,000 years. So our collaborators in winter, they went out to this lake uh, when it was covered in ice. They drilled holes and they collected uh, sediment cores. Um, and myself and colleagues went to uh, a facility in Minnesota to, um, to basically sample these cores for DNA. And then we basically shotgun sequenced them and we ended up with around five to 10 million reads per sample of basically anything and everything that was in the sediment. So that's great. Generating shotgun data, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. But how do you actually confidently identify what you think is mammoth DNA in a really complex sedimentary ancient DNA soup, especially considering that many of these DNA molecules are very short and damaged, so it could easily be misidentified? So the way we approach this is we first started off by aligning to genomes. So we aligned to three different genomes. We aligned to the African elephant and what was then the recently made available woolly mammoth genome. This was to detect mammoth DNA, but we also aligned to a two-toed sloth genome. And the reason for that was just basically to get an idea of just what the background read mapping rate was, the kind of like spurious alignments and kind of schmutz. But then to kind of like clean up these, um, these what was being aligned, we uh, also removed um, we also removed reads that aligned to these genomes, but also aligned to several other genomes that are potential contaminants either through lab processing or um, just from us. And then we ended up basically with our remaining data, which is a very small amount of the total starting data. So. First thing we wanted to do, um, once we kind of like aligned all this data, or we've removed all the potential contaminants is actually first kind of like sanity check is check. Is it ancient? Does it have these damaged profiles? Is it short DNA? And the answer is yes. So for the woolly mammoth uh, DNA that was aligned to the African elephant and the mammoth genome, we get really nice fragment length distributions, but most importantly, we get these uh, five prime and three prime damage uh, DNA damage patterns. And as for the DNA that was aligned to the two-toed sloth, it's just basically schmutz. So it's all very short DNA, so very short molecules that are spuriously mapped with no evidence of damage. So this is good. This is past our kind of like sanity checks. So how does the amount of DNA in the core change through time? When do we lose the mammoth DNA? Well, if we just start with the two-toed sloth DNA, on the, y, on the x-axis here, we've got basically time. And here we have uh, the log 10 of the proportion of retained reads. Now, basically, 
with the two-toed slough, you see very little change through time. Um, and I should mention that here, because this is log transform, this, we're only talking around five to 20 reads or something based on here. But when we look at the mammoth DNA, what we see is we're getting hundreds to a fa more than a thousand DNA molecules identified up until this time point right here. And then suddenly the mammoth DNA basically falls down to these kind of like background levels. I should also mention that this, these squares here, these represent laboratory uh, control, negative controls. So basically all the stuff down here, we consider as absent. So, this was six and a half thousand years ago. So this is what was previously known. But as you can see, we're actually detecting mammoth DNA until later, until around 5,600 years ago. And this is really fantastic because uh, we see this very definitive transition. So I said this core is 13 meters long. We see this transition within a two centimeter interval. Um, and it matches also other proxies for mammoth present that we also looked at in the same study. Um, so that, that was fantastic. And we've basically pushed back, pushed forward the extinction date, uh, to, um, nearly a millennium later than was previously thought, but we're only getting like really small amounts of DNA here, but we did manage to actually get up to 0.4% of the sedimentary ancient DNA matched and identified as mammoth. Now this is pretty astounding considering we got this DNA from mud. Um, if you got 0.4% from a really bad bone, you might be actually quite happy. So to get this from mud, this was pretty, pretty great. But so what we've done here is we've just looked at basically inferred presence and absence. So we've got mammoth present here and then disappearing. Great. But what more can we do? And for this, you really need to sequence much more deeply. So what would, what can we do if we are to sequence more deeply? Would it actually be possible to recover population genetic or haplotype information directly from sedimentary ancient DNA? Now to do this, we kind of, we're shifting gears here. We're moving to a completely different lake up here in Northern Norway. And we basically took two samples from two different cores that would and deeply shotgun sequenced. And these samples are from the last ice age around 20,000 years ago. And what we were looking for in here was this single celled lipid rich microalgae called nanochloropsis. And this was because previous studies had demonstrated that there was probably actually found in quite high abundance within the lake sediment core. So this basically makes it an ideal kind of like target for really getting much more genomic data. And this thing is actually quite um, interesting because it's actually got a lot of biofuel potential and it's used in aquaria. And importantly for uh, doing, uh, for identification, there are genomes, uh, comparative genomes available. Okay, so first thing was a sanity check. So this was basically similar to what we did with uh, mammoths, except aligning to a whole panel of different genomes and filtering through. And what we discovered was that this was Nanochloropsis limnetica. This was the, the genome that the vast majority of the reads mapped to from both of the two samples. And because of the depth of our uh, shotgun data, we were actually able to reconstruct complete chloroplasts and mitochondrial genomes directly from the sediment. And both of these were sequenced to around 64X coverage. Um, and what was really interesting is when once we'd reconstructed these and we kind of like remapped the reads and everything, uh, we sh discovered that um, basically there were multiple different variants present. But first thing, before I get into that, uh, it was ancient DNA, all looks good, passes the sanity checks. But then when we were looking at basically the ratio between the reference allele and the alternate allele, we found that basically there was around 40% of one allele and 60% of the alternative allele, suggesting that there are basically two different uh, haplogroups or living in this in this lake at this time. And we saw this in both the uh, in both samples, in both the chloroplast, mit chloroplast genome and also in the mitochondrial genome. 
And when we basically uh, tease these two out, we call them the high frequency variants and the low frequency variants. When we constructed a phylog phylogeny of complete chloroplast and mitochondrial genomes, what we found very encouragingly from these two different, two different samples that were about the same age, so we found that the high frequency variant um, uh, consensus sequences clustered together separately from the low frequency variant sequences. So this was a really nice kind of like proof of concept that uh, what we were getting was not just, we weren't just recovering these genomes, we were recovering uh, haploid group data that was actually reproducible. And what we next did, because, um, because of course that there just aren't a lot of uh, whole genomes available for these things. So we could only really go to species level looking at this is we actually pulled out the barcode sequences. So there are various barcodes on the chloroplast and mitochondria and in the nuclear genome that we were able to reconstruct for these different frequency variants. And we uh, put them into a phylogeny. So we looked at the loci RBCL, ATNS, and ITS. And what was really interesting from this is the Lanocropsis limnetica, the species that this, uh, this population was identified as, there are actually various varieties of taxa within this. And what we found is that the low frequency variant grouped with variant variety limnetica and the high frequency variant grouped with variant globosa. So that's really cool. We are actually able to identify these things. What these taxonomic ranks mean in reality, I do not know because this is obviously the same population of probably the same algae from the same lake. So whether they actually re represent real taxonomic entities is something that future studies will have to determine. But what about haplotype information from sedimentary ancient DNA? I talked about two haplogroups. Can we go actually further? Well, we really tried with this, and what we, the way we did this is we uh, developed a method, and we basically looked at our reference genome and and our alignments between these two variants, and uh, looked for positions that were at least 35 base pairs apart. That's the, our minimum read length, and they displayed um, variation that would represent a transversion variation. And what we did is we remapped our data to this, and uh, basically looked at the linked sites. So that's how we determine haplotypes uh, to determine how many different haplotypes we can get. Now, of course, this is a very uh, conservative method because our DNA is very short. And because we don't have a reference genome panel for the chloroplast or mitochondria for this, this group taxa, uh, we can't phase these. So we basically have to rely on these kind of, these linked transversion SNPs um, uh, that are linked with our DNA, uh, sedimentary ancient DNA reads. Uh, and what we actually found is that um, the majority of the, of the linked SNPs uh, showed, demonstrated that there were at least two haplotypes as expected from our variant analysis. But we also found that there were some SNPs that uh, suggested there were at least three haplotypes haplotypes. So this is suggesting that actually the way we've done it, although we're pulling out two major haplogroups, uh, there is actually a lot more haplotypic variation in there. But right now we just don't really have the power to, um, to kind of like detect and phase this. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, genome scale data from sedimentary ancient DNA can be used to infer species presence or absence, and this was really nicely demonstrated with the last mammoth project. Um, but also you can recover haplogroup level paleogenomic data uh, f directly from lake sediments. And in future, of course, because I just described this as two samples from around the same time period, because this was a proof of concept, but it should be possible to track genome-wide genetic changes within a lake catchment or within or within the area that of another sedimentary ancient DNA substrate through time. And this has really got really, really cool applications, especially given the fine scale temporal aspect that you can get from sedimentary ancient DNA. But there are many challenges that remain, uh, many bioinformatic hurdles and also other technical challenges, including in the wet lab that still remain. And with that, I just would like to thank uh, Team Last Mammoth, which was led by uh, Russ Graham at Penn State, and also Beth Shapiro and Josh Cap, who basically were 
heavily involved and led the uh, ancient sedimentary ancient DNA analyses when I was at UC Santa Cruz. And also Team Algae. Uh, this was spearheaded by Yuri Lammers. Uh, he's great at this kind of stuff. Uh, and Le Le and Inger Alsos was the senior author, and also Mikhail Pedersen helped out with some of the lab work. And if you want to know more about this, here are basically the links to these two studies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete. Really, really interesting and incredible the fine resolution that you can achieve with these methods. So, questions. We have a question from CPE. If you want to unmute yourself and ask directly. Thanks. Um, thank you for the nice presentation, Pete. Um, so I wonder how much, what was the percentage of the mammoth genome that you were able to recover from the sediment and, and from other organisms as well? So for, the, for that study, we only really looked at the, at the mammoth. Uh, that was what we were interested in, but it was really tiny amounts. So from each uh, sample, we were detecting anywhere between several hundred and uh, two to three thousand reads and these were like you know 80 base pair reads so uh, it's very very low coverage of the genome um, of course so what was interesting is the for the algae actually the amount of algal dna for nanochloropsis we were getting was actually around 0.4 percent as well so actually if those st paul dna extracts were sequenced a lot more deeply there's potential that you could actually get more genomic data however for a mammal like a mammoth the problem is you're not getting a mammoth genome wide data you're getting the genome wide data from the whole population so this is kind of like something that needs to kind of like come in if you want to like do any more kind of like um, uh, more detailed paleogenomic analyses thank you well thank you very much uh, we have to now move on to your next speaker okay. and thank you Pete okay our next speaker is Dr. Alisa Bersinina. Alisa just got her PhD a few months ago, so we all should congratulate her. She's now a postdoc at the Paleogenomics Lab at UC Santa Cruz, uh, the same place where she did her PhD with Beth Shapiro. Her thesis was titled Evolutionary History of Early, Middle, and Late Pleistocene Equids Revealed by Analysis of Their Paleogenomes. Elisa, before her PhD, did a master's at St. Petersburg State University, working in cytogenetics and chromosomal numbers in Lepidoptera. And in the same institution, she got her degree in biology. Broadly, Elisa is interested in the evolutionary history of Pleistocene mammals and paleogenomics. And in today's talk, she, among the various things she might tell us, she might tell us about the oldest sample sequence so far, and why that might be the oldest ever to be sequenced. So, Alisa, thank you very much for being here, and tell us about old horses. Thank you so much, Darka, for inviting me to speak. And uh, this is such a pleasure to speak together in the same panel with Pete and Kelly. Both of these people are actually uh, very important for this work that I'm going to talk about today. And uh, uh, thank you all for coming. So let's jump into equids. A couple of quick facts about equids. Equids are odd toed ungulates. They are a sister, sister group to rhinos and uh, tapirs. And they are uh, one of the most well-preserved groups in paleontological record. And it's a great from one hand and not so great from the other hand. So it is awesome because we can track evolutionary history using their um, uh, paleontological remains. And uh, equids has been an, an example model of evolution for decades. And it's also not uh, great because uh, there are so many forms described and it's, this group is a taxonomical nightmare. There are so many names created and uh, it's very hard to figure out what's going on with the taxonomy. 
in this group, especially when you are dealing with the paleontological remains. And of course, horses are our companions. They played an important role in uh, uh, human history and in human evolution as well. So all present day equids are, they belong to genus Equus and they are split into two major lineages. One is stenoid and another one is cabaloid. And stenoid groups, a stenoid group is a group that donkeys belong, zebras, Asiatic wild asses, and kiangs. And the cabaloid group is the group that encompasses present day domestic horse, mustang, which is the descendant, of the feral domestic horse, and uh, Przewalski's horse. That is the present day diversity. In the past, the diversity of equids have been much larger. There was European wild ass in Europe, there was Equus ovodavi in Asia, there was Harrington Hippus, the genus that Pete described, and uh, those are horses from uh, North America. There were uh, North American cabaloid horses as well, and Hippidian, the endemic of uh, South America. And all these groups, they trace their ancestry to North American continent. And this North America was really the cradle of uh, horse evolution. And it's very interesting that by the late Pleistocene and during the Pleistocene to Holocene transition, uh, all horses, uh, horse equid groups in North America disappeared. They all went extinct together with other large mammals. And the project that I'm talking about today is trying to understand the patterns of this extinction, focusing on the cabaloid group. And the question that we're trying to answer here is the relationship between ancient North American cabaloid horses, Eurasian cabaloid horses, and their present day descendants. And uh, let's summer, make a, a brief summary of what we know so far about their evolutionary history. So first of all, we know that they, uh, Eurasian and uh, North American cabaloids diversified around 1 million years ago. Uh, the first fossil remains of cabaloid horse in Eurasia are dated to be around 700,000 years. And uh, after, well, they diversified, the, the North American horse group, they migrated through the Bering Land Bridge into the Eurasia. And, uh, uh, during the Pleistocene to Holocene transition, as I said, North American group has uh, gone extinct. And in Eurasia, the remnants of this archaic Eurasian cabaloid horse population were, were domesticated around 5,000 years ago somewhere in Asia. So uh, we are asking in the study, what about this uh, Bering Land Bridge, this connection that was present uh, between the continents? And we know for a fact that there was a lot of horse populations present in the area because paleontologists are finding a lot of uh, cabaloid horse remains in uh, Yukon and uh, Klondike and in Russian far north. And did they ever migrate it back? And how connected this co these continents were? And what was the role of this intermittent barrier for the gene flow? So on this graph, you see um, oscillation in oxygen isotope values. And this is a proxy for a global volume of um, ice on the planet. So uh, when there was a lot of ice present, water was trapped in ice caps. And it's very likely that the Bangland Bridge was exposed. And after the cabaloid horse group diversification, there were several periods of time when the, the Bangland Bridge was open. And we know that, for example, it was occupied by human population. This is how uh, Homo sapiens got into North America. And some animals, such as woolly rhino, for example, they never crossed the Bering Land Bridge. They were present in Asia, but never made it to North America. So we are asking what was the role of this intermittent barrier in uh, uh, connect connecting the Western and Eastern Beringian horse populations. And to tackle these questions, we are focusing on Beringia and we are sampling a lot of uh, horse bones. They are coming mostly from uh, Chukotka, Yakutia, and Taimir, and Alaska in eastern Beringia. And there we also have uh, some samples that are coming from present day uh, territory of China and some that are coming from the lower 48 states. 
And by saying we, I of course mean all my amazing collaborators and museum curators and people who are helping me with this work. And they have been doing an amazing job in collecting more than 300 samples for this research. But it's ancient DNA, so uh, not all of these samples are workable. And around a third of those um, bones worked out for DNA extraction. And most of this collection is data is radiocarbon dated and dates are ranging from 10 to 50,000 years ago. Um, before going into the results of this research, let's talk a little bit of, about details and how we are getting data from the bone tissue. And let's talk a little bit about ancient DNA. So uh, as Pete has described, uh, ancient DNA uh, is, has several characteristics. And uh, the, the process of degradation of DNA molecules starts immediately after the organism dies because the machinery that was maintaining the integrity of this molecule is no longer active. So with time, DNA becomes more and more fragmented. The molecule is undergoing this never stopping changes. We, and we can use this uh, demination pattern that C2T transitions to discriminate between ancient DNA molecules and uh, present day intact molecules. And this is also what we see from bone tissues. It's very similar to what Pete was talking about. For uh, degradation, we also see this pattern where molecules are getting fragmented. And in my case, in case of uh, bone, uh, in case of bones, usually fragments are shorter than 100 base pairs, and that means that we cannot really PCR them. Most of my samples are coming from uh, dirt. They have been sitting in dirt literally for ages and uh, they are always contaminated by modern and uh, ancient non-specific genetic material and this graph uh, shows um, samples ranked by the amount of dna that is actually in, uh, endogenous the one that is coming from the horse genome so as you can see uh, like around the half of the samples just don't have enough workable material and contamination is a problem not only in the field, but also in the lab. We are trying to not dispose our own DNA into the bones. So we work in ancient lab facility and we wear these cool hazmat suits. They're, I guess, not so cool when the age of corona, when a lot of people are working in those. But we, this is also our daily life in the ancient lab. And we're just trying to be very careful to not contaminate these bones anymore further. So a couple of words uh, about the process of DNA extraction. We are powdering, uh, we're extracting bone powder, subjected to protein ASK treatment and uh, cleaning, and we make uh, next generation library prep. We are using currently the methods that are very similar to what Kelly's company is working on. So stay tuned for her talk about that. And then we sequence those uh, libraries on Illumina for specimens that are well preserved, we are able to reconstruct high coverage full genomes. And in this case, we're doing deep sequencing and we map them on the reference and get rid of all the contaminant DNA. For molecules of interest, and in our case, we are also re reconstructing uh, complete mitochondrial genomes. For those molecules, we're using RNA bait hybridization capture. And uh, uh, that allows us to either extract for uh, mitochondrial DNA or any other molecules that we could be interested in for the analysis. So moving on to the results, so what did we find uh, from all these uh, specimens? So first of all, we uh, recovered two high coverage uh, genomes of North American horses. Uh, both are coming from Klondike and dated to be around 30,000 years old. And they supplement the panel of previously published uh, ancient Eurasian genomes that are also dated to be late Pleistocene. And uh, we were able to reconstruct the demographical history of these populations using these high coverage genomes. So this is what you see on this graph. This is a fluctuation in effective population time, uh, sorry, effective population size through time. Uh, where we see that uh, after the time when uh, 
Kabbalah Horse Group diversified on Eurasian and North American uh, lineages, they started to, uh, the, the pattern of the demography was quite different. And it seemingly looks like Eurasian populations were doing a little bit better than North American. But interestingly, in the late Pleistocene, especially in the last 100,000 years, uh, both of these populations were experiencing population collapse, which is especially pronounced in the last, in the late Pleistocene in, in the last 50,000 years. Then another analysis that we were um, able to do is the statistics, and this analysis estimates uh, patterns of allele sharing between uh, three populations, and in our P1, P2, and P3. In our case, P1 and P2 are uh, either ancient Eurasian, uh, population or present-day domestic horse or present-day Przewarski and then one of the North American individuals. Donkey is used as an out group to polarize the alleles. So in a null hypothesis, in a null scenario due to the stochasticity in lineage sorting, we would expect that P1 and P3 and P2 and P3 would share uh, uh, on average, the same amount of alleles, and that would produce the ratio of allele counts to zero. But what we found is that there is actually an influx of alleles from North American individuals into uh, ancient Eurasian and present-day domestic horses. We see that this statistic deviates from zero, and that shows a signal of North American admixture into Eurasian horses. Even domestic and Przewalski horse have uh, this uh, signal of admixture. So we have some signal of connection between the continents. Let's look further into that. Uh, with uh, GFOX calistent analysis, we were able to, uh, again, co-estimate the effective population size, population split times, and the amount of gene flow that was going on. So the thicker the line, the larger the population, and um, we found that this calistent analysis supports the results of this statistic, and there is an average two to four, uh, uh, I would say on average that two to four percent of these populations were participating in hybridization events during the last one million years. So these two uh, continental populations maintained genetic connectivity um, between each other, which is in agreement with the uh, statistics results that the, I just showed. Uh, for the, that was for the nuclear genomes. For the mitochondrial genomes, we were able to reconstruct around 80 complete mitochondrial genomes, and we uh, um, uh, this analysis, this phylogenetic tree is built using maximum likelihood analysis. So a couple of interesting things are going on here. The, first of all, there is a, a striking uh, phylogeographic structure of this population. So there is one hopper group that corresponds to Eurasia and another one that corresponds to uh, North America. And uh, interesting thing is that there is a group of specimens that has a common ancestor that, that belongs to Eurasian hopper group, but they are located in North America. Most of them are located in Alaska, in Seward Peninsula, and in Alaska North Slope and the Klondike. So all of these samples are have a radiocarbon date, and the oldest that has this discrepancy is dated to be around 37,000 years old. Um, we did additional beast analysis in order to estimate this divergence here, and the divergence is dated to be around 70,000 years. So that means that this population that of U Eurasian horses migrated back into North America when the Bering Land Bridge was open around 70 to 60,000 years ago. And that actually corresponds well with the other um, migration days that we have from other mammals. We know that mammoth migrated about at the same time and the bison also were crossing the Bering Land Bridge around at the same time. And uh, to summarize what we found, so we do uh, find the uh, very important role of the Bering Land Bridge in connection between two, these two large continental populations. We find that there is a 
gene flow, this gene flow is, um, was persistent throughout the last one million years and uh, the continental populations were connected by admixture and disappearance of this uh, connection, disappearance of the Bering gland bridge ceased uh, the gene flow. And that is, I think, very interesting result because it allows us to uh, think a little bit more in depth about the present day population fragmentations and the present day highways and expansion and seizures and uh, looking at this large barriers allow us to think a little bit about uh, how uh, uh, population fragmentation induced by uh, expansion of human population is going to affect large mammals and especially it's important for the arctic that is affected by increasingly affected by the global warming and uh, that's all that I have for you guys today. And thank you so much, of course, to my uh, advisor, Beth Shapiro, and uh, uh, people who are helping me with the sample collection and with the analysis, Ed Green and uh, Russ Carbett and uh, Russ McPhee and Pete helped me in immensely. Very important role in this project plays Ludwig Carlanda, who helps with generating the data and uh, analyzing some of the samples. And thank you so much for coming, and I will take any questions. Thank you very much, Elisa. Really interesting to see a combination of wet lab work and all the data analysis. Very cool. So, any questions? Here, CPE. You can unmute yourself. Hi, Elisa. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I wonder how long did it take for the North American population, horse population, to disappear, um, given all the changes that were going on in, in their environment? So, we, for the Calabaloid horse population, we know that they were quite abundant in the last one million years. And as we look into the from like 15,000 years ago to 11,000 years ago, they were in a sharp, sharp de decline. And that extinction was rapid, but that was on par with other quaternary extinctions that were going on in the regions with mammoth extinction and other large mammals. So it was rapid, but um, Again, also, like the, the reasons for these extinctions are still debatable, and we are trying to look whether the, the environmental change really was um, this cue that prompted them to decline very rapidly, but it was quite quick, yeah. Does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah, but it, was it then, like, um, could you compare it to the rate of extinction of other species, where all other species that were getting extinct at the same time, uh, you know, um, extinct uh, similarly, time-wise? Time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say that we would need to really collect this large panel of uh, all these large mammals and, and compare them between each other. I don't think this uh, data on extinction rate in them exists. We just know that in like very short amount of time, a lot of groups disappeared. And that correlates with both environmental change and uh, the presence of humans in the region. Uh, so I think it's, yeah. Thanks. Okay, any other question for Alisa? Yes, Grant Sasula. Hi, Alisa. Hi. Um, <laughs> I know, I know uh, a lot about this project, but one, one question I'll, I'll ask you is, a lot of people ask me, with, with all this work that we're doing with ancient horses, the, 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 the public is so generally, they always ask me about phenotype and whether we can actually examine that through ancient DNA and try to look at things like horse coat color and patterning because the horse community just loves that kind of stuff. And I'm just wondering if there's any, any interest from you and your lab to try to look at what, what did these horses actually look like at the terminal Pleistocene in North America? 
Yeah, actually, uh, that's a that's a really good question. We the one so for this project, what we're doing right now is we're trying to publish it and uh, uh, st stay tuned for the biarchive. We're gonna upload the paper for the next project that we're doing. We are trying to do this RNA hybridization capture for fishing for SNPs, fishing for specific variants. And in this panel of SNPs, we do have phenotypic SNPs. We do have some knowledge from the work of Ludovic Orlanda on present-day domestic courses. On, uh, there are some variants that are responsible for dwarfism, for uh, coat coloring and things like that. And this is something that is on my panel. We are still in the process of generating this data, but we will look into that, yeah. Yeah, and just to follow up with that, Elisa, because, uh, you know, we, Pete created this big problem for all of us a few years ago when he published his silly Harrington Hippus horse genus. And we were wondering, is there, are there some pheno, you know, major phenotypic differences that, like in color, you know, sh patterning that may kind of help us understand why those two species were able to live together alongside each other for I don't know, seven million years without ever interbreeding? Um, you no, know, if, if maybe it could, maybe they're, yeah. Is that something that, yeah, it would be cool to investigate that. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, do it. Let's start writing it. <laughs> Put it on your list. Oh, well, it is on my panel, so it is. It is on my list. <laughs> right, well, thank you very much, Elisa. So our final speaker is Dr. Kelly Harkins. Kelly is the funding CEO of, at Claret Bioscience and Australia Forensics. She did her PhD at Arizona State University, where she also worked for her master's. And after that, he moved onto a postdoc between Lars Ferenczen Schmitz at the Anthropology Department and Ed Green at the Paleogenomics Lab at UC Santa Cruz. In, in all those stages of her career, she has been combining paleopathology, bioarchaeology, and genetics. Uh, she's primarily interested in understanding in, in tuberculosis and leishmaniasis in the Americas, but also she worked in the plague, syphilis, and other non-infectious skeletal pathologies. She'd been, she'd been longly interested in hypothesis about how evolutionary and anthropogenic processes associate with the emergence and persistence of human pathogens and their concomitant disease. Uh, Kelly was also a US Fulbrighter in Germany and she got her undergrad from Sycamore College in archaeology and music. So from this paleoepidemiology background, she became more and more interested in the design of novel techniques, applying and the design of novel techniques that are usually applied on ancient DNA methods, but how they could be applied in other situations with degraded DNA, such as cell-free DNA or samples. And she's going to tell us about these methodologies today. Thank you, Kelly, for joining us. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen. Sorry, I'm That's getting okay. used to the, the new type of video platform. I think I've tried them all now as of, as of today. There it goes. Okay, you can see the screen, yes? Yes. Perfect, all right, that was a great introduction because I was gonna start by saying like, this is a very methods heavy talk. Um, and it's been a quite a departure from sort of my previous work studying, like Darko said, the evolutionary history of pathogens that have been um, isolated from archeological human remains. I, I got really drawn into methods development during the three years of postdoc work that I did at the UCSC Paleogenomics Lab. So it's nice to be on a panel with these guys when we, um, it's like old times. <laughs> So uh, today I'll be introducing a method that is called Seriously. Uh, this stands for Single Reaction, Single Stranded Library Prep. 
This is a method that was born out of the world of ancient DNA, specifically the UCSC Paleogenomics Lab and the initial work of Josh Cap in particular. Um, this method uh, was sort of developed to focus on challenging ancient DNA samples, but really it's an efficient method for preparing any fragmented DNA sample for sequencing on Illumina platforms. Now, for those of you who are sort of new to the field of ancient genomics and sort of the nitty gritty of the sequencing aspect of that, um, the process of preparing DNA for sequencing is called a library preparation. So in order for a molecule to be recognized by the sequencer, it must have what are called adapters attached to each end of every molecule. And this step is obviously very necessary, but can be very lossy. And when you're starting with only picograms of degraded DNA, as you are often with ancient DNA samples or museum samples, any improvements in this step will be recovering literally something priceless. And that's what this method seriously aims to do. It aims to recover the most amount of DNA from limited inputs with the added benefit of um, reducing your time at the bench. Next. <laughs> so here is a pool of fragmented or degraded DNA where you might have nicked duplex DNA, um, short uh, DNA that's been damaged or with overhanging ends. Uh, Pete and Lisa talked a little bit about this. Um, and sometimes you have single strands as well. Now, this kind of fragmentation can happen in many contexts, uh, whether it be biological in nature, like it is in cell-free DNA, or the result of postmortem damage, UV damage, or it can be from intact DNA that has been mechanically, enzymatically, um, chemically sheared. And all of these make good substrates for seriously as a single-stranded approach, but pose problems for traditional double-stranded library preparation methods. So double-stranded library preparation methods perform a step called DNA end repair. And what it happens is it can it result in the loss of um, certain pieces of information from DNA or entire strands. Because it's really, it's, its objective really is to um, retain only the duplex double-stranded DNA. And if there are overhangs present, uh, like if it's a five prime overhang, it'll fill it in. If it's a three prime overhang, it will just chew it back. And so what you're left with is um, the majority of the DNA in, in uh, having come from a dupl original duplex form. Now, a single-stranded library prep doesn't only convert single strands, but by denaturing all the molecules um, to be single-stranded, you theoretically have access to all of these different fragments, whether they had been duplexes, whether they had been nicked, uh, whether they had been single-stranded. So if your sample is one that is likely to contain these kinds of nicked or single-stranded substrates, then you might really want to consider the benefits of using a single-stranded approach. I think this was what Elisa was referring to, is that this was a similar method that she had used to uh, uh, extract or you know convert a lot of the, the the DNA that she just presented into sequencing libraries. So we're certainly not the first to consider the benefits of a single-stranded library prep for degraded DNA. Most notably, in the ancient DNA world, there are these two protocols that we refer to as single-stranded 1.0 and single-stranded 2.0. This is from the Matthias Myers group, Gansage and Meyer. Um, the first one being from 2013 and the second from 2017. Now, as I mentioned, single-stranded prep would be a no-brainer if you thought that your DNA pool was highly degraded, theoretically. Right? So the reason I say theoretically is that the process of attaching sequencing adapters to molecules while they're in their single-stranded form is biochemically very challenging especially if you're, if you're trying to use ligation-based based methods. And that's because the um, enzymes that are commercially available or even you know, biologically how these enzymes function um, 
the, the ligases function much more efficiently on double strands. So in single-stranded 1.0, they get around this by using something called circ ligase, which can ligate single-stranded molecules, but it's relatively very inefficient, and it's expensive, and it's a single-source reagent. Uh, there's only one place to purchase it. The protocol itself is very long. I think it spans two days. Um, now, the, there are a lot of improvements that the group made when they uh, established single-stranded 2.0. The most, most important being the use of what's uh, called a splinted adapter. Let me see if I can get a pointer here, laser pointer. Here is this red, um, hopefully you can see my pointer. There's a, a, uh, an adapter here, which is splinted, meaning that it's part double-stranded and has a single-stranded overhang. Um, and this would basically create uh, a double-stranded portion of your molecule and the adapters where you could use a very efficient double-stranded DNA ligase like T4 DNA ligase. But both of these methods, uh, when it comes down to it, require adapter, biotinylated adapters, multiple consecutive ligation events, extension steps, streptavid and pull-downs, so they're, they're kind of lengthy uh, and can be expensive, among other, um, among other things. So what the Seriously method then provides is, uh, I, you know, what we're trying to provide is the best of both worlds, the advantages of a double-stranded ligase without all of the other messy steps. So you can start with your DNA pool and denature the, the molecules and incubate them with a protein that helps stabilize the DNA as single strands. Uh, and then you can go into the ligation step. Uh, the ligation step happens all at once. Um, it's not a consecutive uh, series of, of protocols. Uh, this step can be quite fast, but we recommend up to an hour. That's mostly just convenience. It's like a nice time to uh, you know, eat lunch or something. Um, so we say, you know, leave it up to an hour clean it, come back and perform your amplification, your index PCR amplification. So if we wanna kind of come in closer, take a closer look at the adapter structure to show like what is happening, the forward and reverse adapters that you have to ligate on are both splinted, meaning they both have an overhang of uh, random bases that should anneal to your template, but they are also blocked in such a way that only the ends of the adapters that should ligate can ligate. So this is how we are able to do this in a single reaction that creates a pretty fast and easy workflow. Now we rival and in some cases kind of outcompete uh, some of the gold standard library prep kits out there on the market and I won't bore you with the many kinds of comparison slides we have just to say that we're happy about how the method performs head to head with other kits in terms of yield, in terms of complexity and things like that. I know that ancient DNA labs aren't often buying kits to perform their library prep. They're often um, rolling their own or DIY, which I can totally appreciate. Um, but here, if you're interested, are some just brief comparisons with some kits on the market. Now, anyone who works in ancient DNA knows that capturing the shortest fragments is essential because the majority of your endogenous DNA lives in the fragment sizes well below 100 base pairs. So I'm showing this just as an example of how seriously, uh, when compared to a double-stranded prep with cell-free DNA, um, which is the DNA that's circulating in your bloodstream. Oops. Um, this is just to show that if there are short fragments in your library, you might not want to lose them. So it's probably not that impressive to see this kind of uh, sample where the majority of DNA is over 100 base pairs. That's pretty easy for most library preps to capture. So let's look at something really degraded, hair. So when Darko asked me to give this talk to an audience of the Cal Academy, the first thing I thought that you guys might find interesting is a small case study that we did sampling hair, fur, and feathers um, from living but also extinct mammals. Uh, we thought this sample type might be useful for folks working in museum collections or in fields 
you know, where it could be valuable to non-invasively sample living animals. Now, I'll introduce hair in general briefly because in the past year, we've spun out a separate operation uh, called Astrea Forensics to apply the se seriously sequencing method to forensics contexts. And in the world of forensics, it was long thought that nuclear DNA just wasn't present in hair. Now in ancient DNA, it is certainly not news that hair contains nuclear DNA. Here's a paper from 2008 that looked at a 4,000 year old um, uh, hair, sa hair sample from a paleo Eskimo, excuse me. Um, so the problem is not that it's not there, it's that it's really short, really short as most ancient DNA samples are. But these aren't ancient, these are um, not very old and as in the next slide you'll see, modern samples. So here's a, an example of a library distribution from a hair from 1994, um, processed you know, recently, uh, and it's got an insert size, roughly about, a, about 60 base pairs, but I'll show you the sequencing data from the same hair. That 1994 hair, uh, coupled with the same individual's hair from 2017, and then a second individual's hair from 2017, shows that basically the hair on your head right now is already extremely fragmented, well below 100 base pairs, more around 50 base pairs. So hair DNA was just too short to be observed by traditional forensics DNA testing because the PCR amplicons were just too long. And this is sort of why the, that community thought um, for a long time that maybe this just wasn't present. It certainly wasn't useful for their types of analyses. So a little case study. So in 2019, we collected hair or feathers from six different species here listed in, in this table on the, on the left. And we used uh, one hair or feather per extraction. The extraction method is based on a Dabney protocol, which is a guanidinium based silica column based uh, extraction protocol. Now, it's extremely normal for DNA extracts from hair to be too low to quantify. In, in this case, we wasted a lot of material to just obtain a qubit value so we could show this information. Uh, but normally, we wouldn't even bother trying to quantify because we know we can usually make a good sequencing library at inputs that are lower than a fluorometer's ability to estimate the mass. So we put in somewhere between 200 and 600 picograms into the library prep, which is you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.6 nanograms, with the exception of the sheep, which just performed very well. And what you'll see here is as expected, the hair from these animals collected very recently is very short with uh, average base pair lengths, um, below 50 base pairs. And with just a few million reads, we can very cheaply reconstruct almost the complete mitochondrial genomes. So here are the sort of average coverages, and you can see across the genome, we're, we're getting pretty good coverage. So, so this is um, a pretty cheap way to do this. Remember, this is just a single strand of hair or fur. So what about uh, extinct mammals? Uh, here, the UCSC Paleogenomics Lab provided a couple of samples, one from woolly mammoth, one from woolly rhino which um, are thousands and thousands of years old. I think that Pete and Elisa might know how old uh, Sasha and the Yucca Mammoth are. Um, but we here again used one strand, about four to five centimeters for the extraction and 100 picograms of DNA for the input into the library. And again, um, we observed, well actually we observed a pretty great endogenous DNA rates this is how much of the DNA can be attributed to the organism um, that we, you know, from which the sample derives, which is great for ancient DNA. But interestingly, looking at the length distributions here, if you'll note that the top panel is a modern human hair just collected, you know, at, at the same time that these ancient um, hairs were processed, not in the same lab, but um, at the same time, and you can see that over long periods of time, the DNA stays relatively stable. It gets short, but it, then it stays pretty stable, which makes it a pretty good sample type. Um, also, we see sort of a characteristic DNA damage that uh, 
Elisa and Pete talked about, so I won't explain what it is describing. Um, and then with just very low coverage data, you know, 2 million, 3 million sequencing reads, but only, you know, 30 to 40 percent of those are of the organism, we're able to um, kind of look at the, at the full mitogenome. And look, it is definitely a mammoth. <laughs> I ran a, just a very basic phylogenetic analysis just to show an example of the type of thing that you might be able to do with such uh, data. Now, this is not to say that mitogenomes are the only t type of um, you know markers available from hair samples, but we only sequenced a few uh, million reads here. Now, with human samples, although preservation of hair DNA does uh, vary from person to person, we do aim for complete 3x uh, nuclear genome coverage. So I hope I've shown how seriously could provide some cool data on a sample type that's often overlooked. There's some interesting applications uh, outside of um, my traditional field, things maybe in, in uh, ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, but it's certainly been interesting for our recent work in human identification. And so here's just a little a New York Times article about uh, the work that that Ed Green had been doing at UCSC that we kind of moved over into our operation for forensics. So um, if, if you want to learn more about the method, there is a publicly open access available publication in BMC Genomics. So you can kind of read a little bit more about the nitty gritty of the method itself. And um, it's not only good for ancient DNA. Here's some other you know, substrates that are kind of you, it's, the, the method seems to be very useful for. Um, finally, I just want to uh, thank the team at Claret and Estrella, uh, many of whom came out of the uh, UCSC PhD programs, and also the company founder Ed and Beth Shapiro for providing samples and um, you know lots of um, scientific ed advisory um, related. <laughs> Uh, suggestions and um, Josh Cap, of course, the inventor of the original sort of Santa Cruz library prep method. So, with that, I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Kelly, for this lecture on paleomolecular biology. Really interesting and exciting to see the, the possibilities with this method. So, time for questions. Okay. Hi, uh, I, Kelly. So I'm gonna. I oh, I, I have a question here. I'm gonna jump in. Uh, Grant Zazula here. I'm a paleontologist uh, in Yukon. Oh yeah, um, we met up in so Yukon a couple years ago. I'm that guy that. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so we, you, you talked a lot about hair, but have have you had much su success with other keratin-based tissues like fingernails, uh, horn sheaths, uh, you know, hoof coverings, and things like that, which are also keratin. Not yet. So we haven't ever, ever tried those substrates. You know, we kind of got into this, uh, this particular, you know, hair theme when we were going to present at the, the plant and animal genome conference for our, one of our first sort of debuts. And uh, that was just kind of the easy sample type to obtain. But, you know, most of our focus is on clinical type samples. So if anybody wants to take a, a kit and try it out on some other types of samples, it'd be cool to see if it works. So I have a question, Kelly, uh, re related to the adapters. Yeah. What the adapters that you use, yeah. I imagine they have different lengths of the overhang. So my question is, how, how many different lengths do you use? And for each length, how many different types of adapters do you have? Because it's a random mm -hmm. uh, sequence, a set of sequences, right? So I imagine for, let's say, a five overhang, there might be 20, 30, or two. How many? If you can give us an idea of the proportions, and also how the blocking oligos work. So for the first question, for the single-stranded prep, we actually just have one overhang length. Um, it's it, it's six 
or seven, I should know. <laughs> I think it's seven base pairs of overhang length. Um, and that seems to uh, be, you know, I think a lot of different uh, overhang lengths were tested. That seems to be sort of an ideal uh, length. We have a different library prep, which kind of alludes back to your question, where we actually do provide overhangs from one out one base pair of random nucleotides, which is just the four random nucleotides, all the way out to six. And so we are, you know, then then you're then you're talking about randomers and the pools of possible numbers of nucleotides. So four to the four to the six number of of potential uh, different combinations of uh, of overhangs for each type. So three prime overhang, five prime overhang. P5, P7. So it can get kind of uh, complicated, but for the single strand of prep, we just have the one type. Um, and then the blockers are um, basically just blocking ligation. For example, they're not particularly good at blocking exonucleases or other kinds of um, enzymes that might be present. They just pr kind of inhibit the. Um, I mean, you need a you need a, a five prime phosphate and a three prime hydroxyl to ligate. So basically, it's just yep. making sure that those those ingredients uh, aren't available for that ligation recipe. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, CPE has a question too. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, I wonder if you have characterized the population, uh, the DNA fragment populations in, in, in various different samples of degraded specimens. I'm just wondering um, how many single-stranded uh, fragments do you actually have in, in, yeah, in percentage, in average? Yeah, that's, that's a difficult uh, thing to, to quantify, how many, how many single strands versus maybe how many duplexes are present in any sample. Um, I think we had initially done some experiments where we just tried to um, perform the library prep on DNA, on a DNA pool that wasn't denatured. So theoretically, you'd just be accessing only the molecules that were already single-stranded. But I can't say that we've really spent a lot of time on trying to quantify that. Um, once we moved the method kind of out of the paleogenomics lab, we had a different mission to try to a different r d path to try to get this thing into a kit and commercialize so it kind of stalled some of the cool like ancient dna based research questions um, but there are folks still in the paleogenomics lab who are definitely still working on questions like that so i bet josh cat for example would would have a pretty good idea to that answer but sorry i'm uh that we ha we haven't really looked at that no, thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Kelly. And now I don't know if anyone from the audience or Lisa, Pete, or Kelly, do you have any final remarks or something that you want to that you would like to mention? Any pending questions from the audience? I'm always available on email if anyone ever, ever had to have any other technical questions. Just kelly at clarabyer.com.